that through their cooperation, we will get much closer to realizing the new social contract for data as envisioned by the World Bank's World Divine Data Report 2021, Data for Better Lives. As we move further into the decade of action, and as countries work to recover from the unequal impact of COVID-19, now is the time for the international community to step up its engagement on data and statistical financing. It gives me immense pressure to know that the global data facility and the clearinghouse will now be there to provide unprecedented support in this effort. With that, I thank you. So thank you very much, Haishan. I hope you haven't been too surprised. Maybe we give her an applause. And I hope you are not too confused. We talked so far about the clearinghouse and you just learned that the World Bank launched a global data facility. Uh, and this is, and, and we will be talking about this a bit more. It's, it's literally bringing together more funding, the World Bank's new global data facility fund and the clearinghouse will hopefully contribute to coordinate better those funding, but also to raise more domestic resources, as, we, as you will see. So it's a very much aligned approach. Speaking about alignment, speaking about harmonization, speaking about political coordination, we are very thrilled to have Francesca Perucci with us. She is Assistant Director of the United Nations Statistical Division, um, and uh, the UN has helping us a great deal as a core member of the Bern Network, and it's very nice to have you here with us in the room, Francesca, to give us your perspective. Over to you. Thank you so much, Johannes. And, and good morning, everyone, and, and good afternoon, good evening to all our colleagues and friends joining us remotely. Uh, it's really my great pleasure to be here, and of course, seeing you so many friends and, and colleagues uh, in person for the first time after uh, two, almost two years. So, as we heard, uh, a lot's going on, and then we have some very exciting big announcements uh, as we start this uh, third UN World Data Forum. Uh, many of us remember our community came together for the first time in this forum uh, in 2017, and we launched a common framework to turn our, our ambitions for, for better data for development into real actions. Uh, what we call now the Cape Town Global Action Plan. Uh, and the group behind that plan, the group that really spearheaded that plan, the establishment of that plan, is a group of countries. Those are the high-level group uh, for uh, coordinate partnership coordination and capacity building, a group of 22 countries. And they've been working since then to ensure the implementation and to promote the implementation of the plan. But four years later, we still see huge data gaps. And what we need is better funding, and that has become uh, more evident uh, during the pandemic. As we heard from Aishan, the pandemic has, of course, exacerbated inequalities, including data inequalities. The most recent data that we have from a survey to national statistical offices reveals that 92% of low and lower middle income countries still report a shortage of financial resources to respond to data demands. So we need an effective, effective financing mechanism, and as we like to say, for smarter and more effective financing. The Bear Network, as we heard, was established in 2019 exactly to address those needs and to respond to those, to the, those issues, uh, acknowledging uh, the critical uh, urgency to upscale funding for effective, inclusive, and more resilient data ecosystems. And there's been working very well together with a very, group, uh, very good group of, of partners, and we are proud to be part as the UN Statistics, Statistics Division to be part of the core group. And that's been working closely with a high-level group in line with the principles of those countries, established uh, by those countries. And the principles, among others, I'd like to mention, you know, importance of national ownership, evidence-based uh, uh, and sustainable interventions, and transparent decision-making. So we now have a great opportunity, and uh, Johannes was afraid that we would be confused between the two, the two solutions that we are mentioning. Of course, we are launching the cleaning house today, but we also heard about the important uh, role that the global data facility will play. But we have a good opportunity to implement the Cape Town Global Action Plan and the 2030 Agenda 
uh, with these two complementary solutions. And the, with, with the UN uh, working very closely with the responsible entities, the Secretariat of the Bird Network, Paris 21, and the World Bank. So we will use these uh, two new solutions uh, to mobilize smarter financing for development data and to ensure that we really take actions, the needed actions to implement the Cape Town Action Plan. And we think that by working together, the three entities and the countries in the high-level group, we can ensure coherence and ensure that the, we really feed the country's needs and priorities into the implementation of these funding mechanisms. So we we'll continue to work under the guidance of the high-level group. In addition, uh, more recently, we joined forces, the World Bank, the Secretariat of the Bern Hector Paris 21 and, and our division, uh, to implement a survey to national statistical offices. That is also a mechanism for us to work together and to better understand the priorities um, that countries express in these uh, very difficult times, but in particular to implement the Cape Town Global, Global Action Plan. The survey is also a tool to start thinking uh, on updating the plan. Uh, this is a process that the high-level group has launched uh, recently. Uh, the world has really changed since 2017. Many of us were talking about how different this forum is from our first forum in 2017, when we first attempted this new dialogue and working across the different data communities. So we really need to reflect and see what needs to be changed in the plan and what the new priorities, and especially based on the lessons that we learned over the last uh, couple of years throughout the pandemic. So how do we move this agenda forward? We will continue from the UN side, from the statistics division in the UN, we'll continue to facilitate the link between these two complementary solutions, uh, the, the clearing house and, and the global data facility. And we will ensure the critical role of the high level group and countries in general. The, the high level group is just a, a smaller uh, group that represent really the voices of all different regions in the world, all national statistical systems. And we'll continue to ensure that we hear their voices, we hear and understand their, their priorities, and we really anchor all the actions on, on, on what their uh, needs and, and a sense of urgencies in the particular strategic areas are. And with this, I'd like to conclude. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesca. I think you highlighted a couple of very important points. You mentioned the needs to integrate country voices, and of course the UN is the best place to leverage country voices in those conversations, but you also said something very important, working together. And uh, as you may have realized um, that uh, the debate over the last years, I think we have been merging together two different groups that initially weren't maybe talking so much together. And one group are the development people, and I'm personally, I'm a development economist, and then there are the statisticians. And I still recall that we had conversations, how can we bring both groups closer together, the statisticians and policymakers, in particular in the field of development. And I think over the last years we have seen it's happening. People are talking to each other and are learning from each other. The development people from statistics and data and vice versa. And I'm so excited to now introduce Ida McDonald, a colleague of mine working at the OECD in the Development uh, Corporation Directorate as a team lead. And Ida is also a person, if I can say so, over the last years who get, has been gotten interested in this topic of data for development. And we will now hear a perspective more from, a, uh, from the OECD, who is helping countries in particular on aid effectiveness, aid efficiency. So, Ida, over to you. Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, good morning, everyone. And hello to everyone online. Um, it's a real honor to participate in one of the first sessions uh, of the long-awaited UN World Data Forum in Bern. Uh, it's great to be here. The OECD is a proud member of the Bern Network since its inception, um, and I'm particularly delighted that our team could, could help create this clearinghouse uh, on financing for development, which will be launched. Colleagues, I think we have great reason to be optimistic that international support for data and statistics can be improved. I believe innovation is in the air. With a better understanding of the trends and incentives driving international funding, with a shared platform that helps match demand and supply and share knowledge, and with good practice guidance or principles for development data, governments and all stakeholders involved will be better equipped to step up and strengthen support and investments in development data. 
Over the past, oh dear. So over the past two and a half years, the OECD Development Cooperation Directorate, um, we've been working with member countries to identify and share good practices for better financing uh, to build strong and resilient data ecosystems. And, and that's our emphasis around strong and resilient data ecosystems. Um, in that's, in that's, and so I should say that really the OECD, if for those of you who aren't aware, is qu in quite an interesting position because we serve as the Secretariat to the Development Assistance Committee. This committee sets and upholds standards and best practice guidance for official development assistance, which is quite focused on the SDGs. And in 2020, ODA provided by DAC members increased to reach 161 USD uh, billion dollars. Um, so ODA budgets are a very important source of funding for national statistical systems, with many NSOs relying on ODA to deliver their core functions. However, as you can see in this slide, there are still some paradoxes, and these paradoxes have shaped our work and our research over the past couple of years. The funding paradox is not resolved. There is high and growing de demand for data, including from the development cooperation space. Donors, development cooperation providers are high so drivers of increased demand for data for both uh, contribution to development, but also in terms of the results that they want to, want to achieve in health, in education, environment, and so on. But as we know from uh, funding uh, analysis, including by Paris 21 and Press, and its press report, basically funding for national statistical systems has largely stagnated, if not somewhat decreased, over the past uh, 10 years. It's about $600 million per year compared to the $161 billion that's available in ODA. We still have a scarcity of data on the one hand, but a surge of data on the other. And this raises challenges around data use and data sharing um, that we must all come together around. And we actually have many calls to actions. We have those from the Cape Town uh, action, but in the development cooperation space, we have what we call the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation. And in 2016, they, they, they met in Nairobi, and the outcome document, which is quite illustrative from that report, had 55 mentions of data and support for data systems in 41 pages. So there is a, a lot of commitment there, but we're seeing inertia around operationalizing uh, these commitments, um, and that's something that we are currently working on. So some more good news, I think, is that our research of the, the, o the database of all aid projects that we have in the OECD, and we're the, the guardian of, of, of older projects, um, has found that there is a real surge in the focus on data in development cooperation projects. ODA flows reported to the OECD with references to data in the project description. So we're not saying that this is for national statistical systems or offices, but with references have increased 180 fold from nearly nothing 20 years ago to what we estimate have been around $2 billion in terms of data dimension uh, in project. So, so this trend of growing focus on data, I think provides a fresh opportunity to make the case to improve the support. As development agencies' interest in data grows, so will the pressure to be more strategic, more effective, and sustainable in that support. And this, in turn, will call for better coordination and good practice guidance. When we look closer at the database um, of, again, the DAC members, um, the financing picture becomes much more nuanced, in fact. First up, um, the findings are consistent, as I mentioned earlier, that support for general statistical capacity is stagnant, if not declining relative uh, to, to how it's been going, and that's where you see this minus six on the general statistical capacity. Second, there are some interesting trends in sectors. Funding for health data, but also economic data and agricultural data and gender data is up, although, although in the case of gender data, that came from a very, very low base. These trends mirror, to a certain extent, the development cooperation priorities of the DAC membership and some specific SDGs. In sum, strengthening of data and statistical systems is not the highest priority in development cooperation. However, if data gaps or needs become a priority, they get funding. There could well be scope to create incentives for investments in sectoral data to help build national statistical systems. And this is something that we really do want to, to in, in, investigate further. I invite you to read our de data for development profiles that we published in June and which contribute to the Clearinghouse um, because they give much more wealth of information of 14 DAC members who are really engaged in this, in this area. And to acknowledge the great support and contribution of my colleague Simon Lang, uh, who was a key uh, behind this work. 
I won't be, won't be too long now on the, the last bits. Um, as we've been working on this uh, find funding and better funding over the past couple of years, we find that there really is a compelling mutual benefits case for smarter and more effective finance for data statistics. It's actually win-win for development cooperation providers, but also for countries and for the national statistical systems. Effective support for data capacity in systems leads to more and better data. More and better data increases the effectiveness of international cooperation. But there are several tensions that do need to be ironed out. We need to ensure that short -term data support for short-term data production does not undermine the long-term development of systems. Domestic demand for data can be low in developing countries, as we know, especially relative to the demand for data from development cooperation. So national strategies in developing countries need to incentivize an alignment uh, for this. The openness and accessibility of existing government data needs to improve, while international development actors need to decrease the fragmentation of data initiatives. Create data that are not used, or as Samantha Custer and colleagues keep telling us about the data graveyards that exist there. There's so much data there that's not even used. And so we surveyed our members, and this is my second last slide, and really, you know, they are very well aware of the biggest challenges to, re to realizing mutual benefits. It's financing, even though the case needs to be made that we need more financing for national statistical systems with the Development Assistance Committee members. But where we see the coordination between countries, between donors, with partners, alignment, and ensuring that development cooperation is based on data are still the key challenges that we need to look at. So our ideas for way forward are the following. I think we can join forces for progress. We, we basically feel that there are three key solutions um, that we can rally behind together to make progress and to develop some effectiveness principles that all stakeholders can sign up to. We think that aligning data support with countries' long-term needs and priorities should be a key principle and, and an area of action. That strengthening data uptake and use among all stakeholders should be a second area of action and that building inclusive and accountable partnerships to realize data's potential is another area of action. And underneath those three areas, we can really come up with good guidance uh, practices. So with concerted action by all relevant actors, and I invite you all to, 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 to join us, and to address these strategic issues, financing for data will contribute to strong, stronger and more sustainable data and statistical systems. For us, the clearinghouse can be a critical platform for, for facilitating these partnerships and coordination to achieve that goal. And at the OECD, we really look forward to helping it succeed and to contributing our data and research to that platform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shida. Um, Thank you so much, Ida. I was, my mind was already jumping. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ida. No, I think your presentation set very nicely now the stage for the global launch of the, of the Clearinghouse. Um, one interesting finding of the data that you presented to us was that development providers, development aid agencies, say very openly that they have issues with coordinating themselves in giving support. And interestingly enough, as Francesca just told us a few minutes before, Partner countries say that, and national statistical officers in, in the very recent survey that was just done two months ago or so, also said coordination within the statistical system is a huge challenge for many national statistical officers. And even then, the challenge of coordination between the aid agencies and the statistical offices on the ground is, is, a, is, is a very, very important topic. And transparency, more providing information, will hopefully be helping in reducing this coordination uh, problems. So with this, now we come to the main part of this session, the global launch of the Clearinghouse. And um, let me introduce uh, the two colleagues who will be doing this. Um, Shaida Badi, Managing Director of Open Data Watch, and Jurai Jada from uh, the Burns Secretariat, Coordination Lead, and also with Paris 21. So without further ado, Shaida, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Johannes. We are super excited, of course, for uh, today launching the clearinghouse for the financing for development data. What you will be seeing is the culmination of work of two years of work by a very dedicated team. And we will not mention the team members, but you know, it's a very strong team and they've all been up last night. So um, working on finalizing the, uh, the launch of the, of the clearinghouse. Um, 
So the, the clearinghouse actually, or the idea of the clearinghouse was born in, in Bern Network, and in fact in this city. And the idea was that the, the stakeholders the, of the Bern Network came together, and together they decided actually that they, they, we needed a different approach. We needed a much more holistic action uh, towards, um, uh, towards smarter uh, financing for development data. We couldn't just ask for more financing. We came up with the Bern Network 5 action plans, which, which captured those holistic actions that we needed to do more resource mobilization at the national level and, at, uh, and of course, at the international level. But we also needed more effective financing. We need to take advantage of synergies, as we've seen with other vertical funds or other special funds. And we needed to be much more synergetic and take advantage of sectoral investments that are going into the sectoral funds. So to address these challenges, together came out the clearinghouse. And the vision of the clearinghouse, number one vision, has been and you'll be the judge of that, whether we have met that, is been to provide an information system that would facilitate making decisions, facilitate making coordinations, and some of the cases, you know, making a case for more financing, facilitate coordination for um, information for, uh, for advocacy and for decision making. So that was really the main vision of the clearinghouse. And to make that change and to make it happen, those of you who are in the data business know for such an information system or platform, you need a lot of information. So much of our work in the past year or so has been to identify what are the existing sources that we need to be bring together and what are some of the new sources of information we need. You know some of the existing sources, but we also had to do some methodological work to be able to interlink some of the in existing uh, sources. Then taking advantage of the new sources, like the new survey that uh, Francesco just mentioned that comes with the efforts of the World Bank and UNSD and, and uh, Paris 21. And of course, working with IDOS group, we brought the DAC uh, country profiles from the Data for Development Initiative. And much more, of course, this is just a minimum viable product that you will see, but you will see much more information coming. Right now, what we have in the launch version of the pilot, we have 36,000 projects. We have uh, profiles for 23 IDA countries. We have profiles for seven development agencies providing aid. And we have more than 700 resources that are, can be downloaded. So it's really a wealth of information. We still call it the minimum viable product, but it's the richest minimum viable products I've ever seen. So that was a vision one, thank you. So, and you will be the judge of that. All along, as we were developing this, the main thing we had in mind was the user. And Thomas Gass, who is kind of the, you know, the, the man behind this idea of clearinghouse, always telling us, don't forget the user and be careful on how this is gonna be used by whom for decision making. So that was the, the vision of the, of the clearinghouse. But the second thing I just wanted to mention on the vision has been not only bring data and connect it and make it available, but also bring communities together and connect them. And I think today you've seen that communities that are coming together. And I must say, I'm really proud of how we have been achieved to bring these communities who used to work very effectively, but in silos. But we bring them all together and connect them. You've seen the high-level group and, of course, the clearinghouse becoming in service of the implementation of the global um, uh, the action plan for Cape Town Global Action Plan. You've heard from Haishan and how the clearinghouse connects to the new global data facility. You've heard from Ida how the clearinghouse is going to be helping with development effectiveness and DAG. And one new thing that you're going to hear more is we're also connecting to the sectoral side of the financing. And you'll hear from our representative from Gates on how the clearinghouse is going to be used for gender data financing. So, this second vision of connecting communities is hugely important. Now going to the most important part of this presentation is for you to see the clearinghouse. We were brave to take this, uh, um, this initiative on, but we are even more brave now to show you live. And those of you who have done live presentation, you know what, how much risk you take. <laughs> 
So over to you, Jorai. Thank you so much, Shada. And if we can put on the screen, it is my absolute pleasure to show you for the very first time the live clearinghouse platform, which is now on the screen and is accessible at smartdatafinance in one word, dot org. And what you can see here on the screen in front of you is the home page of the platform, from where you can navigate and find a range of detailed information on the financing flows for data and statistics. And you can use the tabs up here on the top to navigate these different categories of information. So they include funding flows, which is information on the supply side, funding opportunities, which will take you to both recipient country profiles as well as profiles on aid providers, you can also act, uh, access a range of project profiles, as well as resources, including over 700 policy and other documents. And you can also go to a community forum here where you can connect with other users and really support the partnership building. And of course, by going down here and clicking on the blue button called Gender, you can access a dedicated gender data financing channel, which will give you a comprehensive overview of financing flows to gender data for the past 10 years. So allow me to illustrate how this works. Let's say, for example, that I was interested in seeing the global and the overview of financing flows to data and st statistics. I will click on the fund funding flows button up here, which will take me to this page. And this page provides a global overview of near real-time financing flows, including temporal trends, as well as trends by SDGs, which you can see over here, government functions, and statistical activities. And I can narrow down on any of these by clicking on the buttons above the colorful bar you see over on the right. And by scrolling down, I can also narrow down and hone in on any country on the map here, highlighted in the colors, and see what the financing flows are at that country level. So, if, for example, I wanted to know what the funding flows for data were in Malawi, let's say, in the period from 2015 to 19, I can go up here and set the time period, which covers 2015 to 2019, set it to all time, and then scroll down and go to Malawi on the map. And by clicking here, I can very easily see an overview of both the commitments and the disbursements by aid providers, both totally and by the individual provider. So what I can see here is that Malawi received about $28 million in commitments during this period, and the top providers were the US, the World Bank, and the UK. So if I were an officer, let's say, at the National Statistical Office in Malawi, I can use this function to very easily see who the top providers are operating on data and statistics financing in my country if I wanted that information. And if I were an officer from a development agency, I can see using this top-down list who I could reach out to to collaborate on different projects or maybe learn from their experiences, again, if I wanted that kind of information. So from here, if I wanted to deep dive on any one country, a recipient profile, or a pro aid provider, I could go up to the funding opportunities page I mentioned earlier, or I can just stay on this page and scroll down to this section where I can have a quick access to the different recipient as well as the provider profiles. So if I were to continue with my dive into Malawi, let's say, I can click on this button here, which will take me to this dedicated recipient profile. And what you can see here under the country name is a little button that says in-depth study. What this means is that for Malawi, we have information on financing flows and needs, not just for the NSO, but also for four to five other line ministries in the national statistical system. So including the Ministry of Agriculture, of Health, and so on. And we have this information on the clearinghouse for three, three other countries in addition to Malawi. And these are Rwanda, Niger, and Gambia. So on this page, I can see not just the top provider to data and statistics from the period 2017 to 2019, but by scrolling down, I can also find information on the total budget for the NSO, both past and current, as well as future budget expectations, if I scroll down here, 
in addition to key benchmarks. If I go even further down here, on the statistical performance of the country, and I can use this information to understand in the long term what the impact is of investments into data and statistics at the country level. And when I scroll even further, I go to a series of individual projects. So just to give you another illustration, if I were an officer at the NSO in Malawi, and I wanted to quickly see what the budget shortfall is for 2022 and let's say 2023. I can scroll to the graph I just showed you earlier, so going back up here, to easily find this information under this section on future funding. And I can see in the green what the total planned budget is for the NSO from the government. In yellow, I can see the contribution of aid providers. And in red, I see the shortfall. And I can find this information both in US dollars and in the local currency. So by hovering over this graph, I can see that for the NSO to maintain statistical operations 2022, it requires an additional $2.9 million. And for 2023, this information shows me that the figure is 3.1. So I could pop that into my report if I were putting one together. Now, if I were interested, I can find this kind of financing information in detail for individual projects by the NSO by going back down to the project section that I showed you earlier and by clicking on any one of these individual projects. So let's say environmental statistics. If I were to open that up, I can see the total planned budget dispersed and planned by the government, as well as the total support planned and dispersed by aid providers for each year of the project where this information is available. And as Shada said, we are drawing on data from over 36,000 projects for the very first time. And you can navigate this information at the country level through these profiles or through the project button I showed you earlier at the top of the Clearinghouse page. Now, this is an example of a recipient country profile and we have seven comprehensive and detailed profiles for our aid providers available on this version of the Clearinghouse drawing, of course, on the work that I mentioned earlier by the OECD. So please do take a look perhaps after this session and have a look around. Now, Shada mentioned earlier le the leveraging of sectoral or thematic entry points for data and statistics financing. And I wanted to give you a quick example here of what that will look like using the gender data financing channel on the clearinghouse. So this is a page that can be accessible and is accessed from any one page on the clearinghouse by clicking on this blue button here. And if, when I do so, it will take me to this comprehensive page on financing for gender data. So let's say I were a program officer at an NGO looking to put together a funding proposal for a project on gender data in the Pacific region. I can go to this page and I can have a quick look around at the global level first, seeing that there is information on funding flows from 2010 to 2019, information on the different SDGs requiring sex disaggregated data over on the right in the colorful boxes. And scrolling further down, I can see information on the top global data financing providers, as well as information by project. And I will also have on this page information on different benchmarks on the index of the global level for data financing to understand what the trends are overall. So coming back to my proposal for gender data in the Pacific, I will go back up here and I can navigate this information at the regional as well as the country level. So in my case, I want to go to Oceania. So I click on this button and I come to this page where I can find all the information I need at the regional level. And I can see by scrolling on this page that, okay, the financing flows for gender have fallen in this region in 2019. And I can also see if I wanted to know who the top providers are on this gender data financing in the region. So I see that these are the World Bank, Australia, and the United Nations Children's Fund. So I have the information I need to reach out to these institutions if I wanted to do that, and even use the community forum on the clearinghouse or drop a question just to learn what the experiences were like with these projects. So I, as you can see, the Clearinghouse gives you access to a wealth of information you can use to put any kind of project proposal or other to support other work you may be doing. 
And while I will end my demonstration here, I can only say that this has highlighted just a few of the features and the functionalities on the clearinghouse. And we are very much in a learning process with all of you, as Shada mentioned. So we would warmly welcome your comments, your feedback, and any suggestions. Please do reach out to us at this contact detail information, which is contact at smartdatafinance.org to drop us any ideas or comments. I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both Shida and Jurai for giving us this uh, great appetite, appetizer to, to, <laughs> to go and to check out the, the site. Uh, let me just reiterate, it's a prototype. It's a minimum viable product. So we need your help to further improve it. Uh, it's, it's the beginning. It's not the end, right? So we will continue to develop the site. Second point is there is a very detailed methodological note that you can find. I think some of you are real experts on the topic. And if you drill deeper in terms of press and CRESS and other abbreviations in terms of um, how we monitor, how, how did we source the data, there is a detailed note. So we invite you also to look at this detailed methodological note. And last but not least, you probably have some questions. I'm just aware of the timing. Um, it might be a bit difficult to open up for questions, but we, we will be staying here after this uh, event. So if you have questions, please reach out to us. And for everybody on the virtual call, um, thank you so much for already engaging in a chat. You can't see that, but there is a live Zoom chat acting now where people ask questions. And my colleagues in Paris, in parallel, answering those questions or trying to answer those questions. So uh, it's a truly hybrid event. Uh, without further ado, let's move on to um, voices from partners. Um, it's very important that uh, we have heard already um, Malawi, Rwanda uh, has been uh, two case study countries for this exercise. And we have two people joining us just in a second virtually and to give their impressions and how this site can be useful for them. But before doing this, let me just allow again virtually, because I think it's 12 o'clock maybe now in, in, in Seattle, Josh Loschmann, who works for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the most important foundation in terms of providing support uh, also on data and statistics. And um, Josh Loschmann is the deputy uh, interim director for gender equality. And um, he will share his perspective just now uh, with a video. So over to Josh and uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm so pleased to join you today for the UN World Data Forum. It's a particular pleasure to be here with partners all around the world, even if we can't be together in person this year. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic threatens to eliminate development gains and push millions of people newly into extreme poverty, reverse decades of progress on healthcare and education. We also know that women and girls are among the hardest hit. Last year at the virtual forum, the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Mark Sussman, spoke about some of the emerging data on how the pandemic was impacting gender equality. Since then, the foundation has worked with partners to better understand how the pandemic has affected women and girls. For example, through the disproportionate job losses and increased burden of care. And how we can create smart and inclusive policies and programs to build a more equal and resilient future. But even in pre-pandemic times, gaps in gender data and the lack of trend data made it difficult to see this whole picture of progress for women and girls. When it comes to gender equality, too often we just don't have the numbers. That was true before the pandemic, and it's true now. This is in part because investment in gender data collection has historically been low on the priority list for national statistical offices. Even before the pandemic hit, many countries were either not collecting or not making available data broken down by sex, age, and other characteristics. <clears throat> we did see growing momentum through the efforts of advocates in some offices. Work was underway to close gender data gaps and to get specific about the financing needed to do it. But national statistical offices are facing unprecedented challenges. Most offices, particularly those in low and middle income countries, report that overall financing has decreased as resources are channeled to immediate pandemic response. 
the fiscal crunch created is particularly acute when it comes to gender statistics. We know that other crises tell us that gender is often on the chopping block. This brings me to the new clearinghouse. It provides up-to-date information on the state of gender data financing landscapes. It will make it easier to understand country needs, the availability of resources, and gaps in funding for gender data. It will facilitate targeted, streamlined, and collaborative investment decisions across the board. This is vital for an organization like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we see it as playing a vital role for a diverse group of users. Some examples, donors can use the clearinghouse to identify country-level data funding gaps, benchmark countries' data funding, and highlight opportunities for joint projects with other donors. Government officials can use it to assess funding gaps, look at opportunities for donor funding and domestic resources, and access best practices to improve the effectiveness of investments. And civil society organizations, including women's rights organizations and networks around the world, can use it to strengthen their advocacy for better and more reliably produced gender data. It's also an important resource to track progress over the next five years on the gender equality commitments made at this year's Generation Equality Forum and ensure accountability. This ability to take a magnifying glass to the resource allocations for gender data and statistics has been a critical gap in this space for years. So it's probably clear then that our foundation is excited about the clearinghouse's potential to make a difference for gender data financing to join other users in the effort to make smarter financing for data a reality. We're very happy to announce that we plan to support Paris 21 for the next stage of the platform's development. We are and will continue working closely with Paris 21 and other partners like UN Women, the ILO, the World Bank, Data2x, Global Health 5050, and Equal Measures 2030 to advance the tool. We're hopeful that the Clearinghouse marks a big step forward that will strengthen a broad coalition of stakeholders working on a common goal of building a sustainable architecture for more and better gender data financing. Because gender data needs champions now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. It was great to hear him from, from Seattle. Uh, and also um, that he again mentioned this specific gender channel that I invite you to, to look at. So if you go to the main page, you see this blue button, gender, and you find all the information that he was also referring to. So without further ado, and I'm realizing we are a little bit behind time, so if you can give us 10 more minutes, I think we started 10 minutes late, if that's okay. Um, we can uh, now turn uh, to our two um, country speakers. Um, we uh, have the great pleasure to have with us um, this morning here, hello. Um, we have Mercy Kanyuka, who is the Commissioner of Statistics at the National Statistics Office in Malawi. And we will see in a minute Ivan Morenzi, Deputy Director General, National Statistical Institute of Rwanda. So without further ado, uh, Mercy, can you give us your perspective on the Clearinghouse? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Johannes, and thank you, everyone. I hope I'm uh, audible enough. Um, Congratulations to the steering house, uh, the clearing house. Congratulations. I, I will say a little bit. You, ha you have actually seen the, the demonstration on Malawi, and the, uh, I'm sure that has spoken for itself on the use of the clearing house. The Malawi National Statistical uh, System is implementing its 2019 to 2023 strategic plan in which it lays all the strategic plans, budgets, and statistics generation in all major sectors of the country. It is important that we should realize uh, and be able to mobilize the resources, adequate resources fully in time uh, to realize the strategic objective, uh, objectives of making data available and accessible for evidence-based planning. So the clearing house, has come at a very important time, very opportune time uh, to help uh, resource mobilization. Uh, more so now that we've been, we are coming from uh, uh, the period where governments and COVID partners are really under the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So it is timely, uh, and uh, apart from making financing for development data more efficient and transparent, the Clearinghouse will provide a platform for making statistical data generation activities more visible. There will be no issues of du uh, duplication, where we are uh, financing duplication, which have been uh, the concerns of development partners. The platform will clearly show how much funding has been invested into data generation, how much was or will be required, and what are the shortfalls. Such information will be very important and one-stop shop for both governments and development partners who can easily plan, mobilize, and reserve financial resources for areas that will be of interest to them. Uh, it is heartening to hear that the Clearing House plans to call uh, uh, to roll out country hubs for 2022, and this will enable us to showcase our data generation activities and financing at a country level, you've seen it, and the leveraging support from local development partners and our governments. The platform, I think this is, this is another uh, dimension of the platform, will also provide us with a chance to enhance our partnership with our neighboring countries in the areas of resource mobilization, information as, a, as well as equipment sharing in the spirit of South, South cooperation. So we will be able, we can, it can actually facilitate that resource mobilization within the neighboring countries jointly and then be able to share equipment. Um, at this juncture, let me thank the Paris 21, our clearing house coordinators for choosing Malawi as one of the few pilot countries you, the demonstration was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mercy. And I think Mercy highlighted one important point that hasn't maybe given so much attention to that the clearinghouse idea is also to uh, come up with good stories so that you can go to the site if you are in the National Statistical Office, as you say, in, in your country or in a neighboring country, and you can find good stories of how to mobilize domestic resources. The, the clearinghouse is, we want to in, increase resources from, for development aid, but we also want to make, at the end of the day, we want to raise domestic resources for better funding for data and statistics, because only if a government puts resources into this, it will be a, a real priority for the government. So we hope uh, that we can find uh, in the future and already today some good stories of how to do this, the communication with the finance minister and planning minister. So thank you so much, uh, Mercy, uh, and all the best. So let's move on directly to Ivan. Let's go to Rwanda. Uh, if you can just get Ivan on the screen, please. Thank you, Johannes. Hello, Ivan. Nice to see you. I hope you can nice, see all nice of us. To see you. We can hear I you. Hope wonderful. You can hear me. Okay. Thank you. It's a it's a pleasure to join this important conversation from Rwanda and. Um, the time zones are exactly the same. I think the topic at hand is one uh, which is very relevant. I appreciate um, the partnership by the different uh, partners on this key topic. And just looking at the attendance in the room, for me, that's very encouraging, even though I can't see everyone. Um, so what we're talking about here, financing for data, in my view, is, is something actually we should have given attention some years back. Because let's be honest, um, the demand and the need for data has been growing uh, over the years uh, at the risk where we have not matched the demand for the data, meaning us as NSOs, especially in, in developing countries. Um, we, we are at a point in time at a critical juncture where we need to really raise our effort in, in making sure that there's available funds for producing key status uh, activities but now we are going even at another level where we are exploring other alternative sources of data to complement uh, traditional statistics, namely big data, especially I will speak for our country in Rwanda. And so when you think of all these opportunities, all these needs, it's, it's quite overwhelming as, as a leader in a statistics office in terms of how you are able to mobilize those needed resources. But I think this clearing house now is an opportunity for all of us to engage proactively and, and look at the, what's happening and be inquisitive to engage the, the relevant stakeholders with, within the countries and clarify where need be. Um, but 
I think with that effort and, and interest, I think we can get started then and, and really the resources are there. I think this is, in my view, an opportunity, the clearing house is an opportunity to help us get coordinated, see the specific needs, see the specific plans and be able to commit ourselves. And I think for us in Rwanda, we've had an interesting journey uh, of, of the last 15 years. This is our third national statistical development strategy we are, we are undertaking right now, which goes until the year 2024. And so this clearing house what, for the information it has picked from Rwanda has been, you know, clear statistical activities uh, across the various sectors, economy, social, health, eh, eh, all the sectors, and, and be able to map them but also show the, the, the budgets which were, which were already well worked out. Um, but there's always uh, a room for us to engage and clarify where need be. And as rightly put, uh, I think this is not only serving the development partners, it serves the in-country um, uh, leadership in terms of the Minister of Finance and the others in trying to be able to see what has been uh, done by the different parties. So it's exciting, but I think I want to challenge us that uh, this is not just uh, enough for us to have this platform, but how proactively we, we respond to it, we, we work together to mobilize the resources, and yes, we can still be relevant to, to respond to the various needs by the various stakeholders, both in the public sector, in the private sector. The private sector is growingly asking us information. On, on a weekly basis, we have uh, over 10 requests coming to the National Institute of Statistics, Rwanda but also researchers on the other hand, and obviously development partners. So I think the outputs are definitely relevant for so many stakeholders to inform policies, to inform innovation, to inform uh, right uh, development actions. And I think if we can follow through this, it will be so meaningful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivan. Great comments, and as you said, I mean, the use of the platform lies in that it's actually being used and put into practice, and it leads to action. Uh, so thank you so much, and also for thanking for mentioning the NSDS, the National Plan on the Development of Statistics. Uh, as we have seen in one of the statistics, um, looking at uh, where investments are currently made, we saw this decline in general capacity development. And to be very honest, this is a bit worrying. If, if all the money now, the extra money goes into specific sectors, and I think this great slide from the OECD showed where we might need to put attention that also foundational data systems are strengthened, and not only specific uh, parts of, uh, for instance, health data ecosystem. So anyway, Ivan, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and it's now a great pleasure for me to um, introduce Thomas Gass for, his, for our concluding remarks. Thomas is, to some extent, the mastermind behind uh, the Clearinghouse. Uh, in all honesty, um, it was uh, he introduced to us, to me, the first time he mentioned Clearinghouse. I had no clue what Clearinghouse is. Um, and so we went on the internet site and we Googled it. And I think you gave an interesting <laughs> example with forestry and conservation and something like that. And I think Thomas had this already, the vision, the vision of how it could go. And he gave us his uh, intellectual lead, and uh, we were so grateful for this, Thomas, and also, of course, for the support of Switzerland. So Thomas is the Assistant Di Director General from the Swiss Agency, um, uh, Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Good to have you here, Thomas, and over to you. Thank you, Johannes, and good morning to all of you. It's really great to have you also joining us uh, live today from, from all over the world. You know, what... What made Agenda 2030 so special and so ambitious is because civil society, interest groups, and others came and pushed open the doors of the United Nations and, and, and made the, the diplomats uncomfortable by, by raising the ambition. You see, the, the, the classical way that we have in our international system of solving things is we identify a problem and then we establish a big commission and then we have to uh, get a vertical fund, of course, going. And, and when you're sitting at the other end, and now I'm, I used to be on that side, as, as many of you know, and when you're sitting on the, on, the, on the side of a development agency and every six months you get a call from another vertical fund, um, that's asking you to, to blindly trust them and say, well, just put another, uh, 
you know, a couple of dozens of millions into this fund, and you can have a seat at the table, etc. But they don't really tell you what they're going to deliver, you see. That's so yesterday. Huh? Today, what we plan to do here with this, with this clearinghouse mechanism is to actually make use of the, the power of, of our technology and of our capacity globally to connect and to, and to make this, this market of interesting projects and interested investors transparent and allow everyone to participate on a real-time basis. Because what interests me is not so much to invest 20 or 30 million into a fund where afterwards I get to sit on the, on the board or on my minister, etc. What I want to see is what can I do, for example, in Benin to, to help to disaggregate data or, to, uh, or work in, in Albania to, to decentralize and modernize the statistical system. What can we do uh, with WHO to protect the, the health data of individuals? What can we do in Tanzania, for example, for, to empower the NGOs to use the data to hold their governments accountable? These are the things we want to do. And so with this kind of, of database, with this kind of community-built space, we hope that we can access this kind of information. And so here, I guess, all I want to do is make, sh make sure you're part of this, because this is where it's going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas, uh, for these concluding remarks. So it's an open invitation for all of you to join this journey. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm so excited that uh, we have now officially launched the Clearinghouse uh, site. Uh, the Global Data Facility has been launched. So thanks so much for, for being part of this. <laughs> Apologies for getting a little late. But let me just close with a few words of thanks. Um, as you can imagine, many, many people, institutions are behind this uh, success that we are here where we are. And uh, I just wanted to read out uh, and a big thanks uh, to, to all the colleagues who have been helping with this. So um, there's the development team at Open Data Watch uh, and at Paris 21. Um, there were a few colleagues working very, very late, uh, getting not much sleep over the last um, couple of days. So thanks a lot to the colleagues uh, uh, in Paris and, and wherever they are. Um, then I would also like to thank and acknowledge in particular the support, of course, of the government of, of Switzerland. Um, our partners here uh, with the United Nations Statistical Division, the World Bank, uh, as partner OECD, but also specific institutions working on gender like Data2x, um, the Canadian IDRC, Eurostat, and of course all the members of the Burn Network. And in particular I wanted to uh, call out here the IMF, the UK, and the Global Partnership on Sustainable Development, also a great partner uh, in, in, in the Burn Network. So thank you so much for coming. Please use the site, uh, spread the word. And I wish you now a, a wonderful Monday morning and rest of this uh, World Data Forum. Thank you very much.